Hey, everybody. Happy Monday. Welcome back to the Speak Up for Blue podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Lewin. We got a great show for you today. It's a holiday here. It's a civic holiday here in Ontario, and I'm really happy I got the Monday off. So this is coming out a little late, later than normal. I apologize for those who download the episode every 8 o'clock, on, uh, 8 a.m. on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, but uh, it's it's a holiday. I was up late last night, and I uh, just decided to do it this morning rather than later trying to find stories to put together for this uh, for this episode. Uh, also, just to let you know, I've been doing a lot of uh, or more YouTube channels, uh, more YouTube videos for our channel, Speak Up For Blue. If you go to speakupforblue.com forward slash YouTube, you can see some of those videos. I've also been posting these podcasts on YouTube. Uh, I did it just as a way to promote uh, the, 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 the podcast on uh, other channels such as YouTube, which is like the biggest or the second biggest search engine in, in the, uh, in the world other than Google, uh, owned by Google, of course. But I decided just to do that, just to one, provide a, a different way to consume our podcast. So if you don't listen to it on a mobile phone or, you know, you're at work or, you know, you're on a desktop or a laptop and you want to kind of hear it in the background, you just head over to speakupforblue.com forward slash YouTube and you can listen to some of our podcasts in the background. Plus, you can check out some of our other videos as well that I've started to make. I uh, apologize if they're not like the best quality, but I'm just trying to do quick Ocean News updates for people, again, on this new platform and, and grow our community. So um, speaking of which, our community uh, is growing over on Facebook. Our Facebook group uh, just passed 200. So thank you very much for all the members who have joined, all the listeners who have joined from here from the podcast, because that's where I've been promoting this is on this on this podcast. So you, the audience members, have been joining in droves, which is fantastic. Uh, and if you haven't joined, what are you waiting for, guys? It's time, guys and gals. It's time to to move over to Facebook and continue the conversation. And the reason why I did it was to literally continue the conversation. So I start the conversation by making you aware of certain things that are going on. And uh, there are no doubts that you have opinions or concerns or comments or questions on said said podcast topics and I think it's, it's you have the right and 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 I think you should have the the opportunity to respond or comment in the group and I think it's a great way for me to interact with the audience and seeing what the the audience wants as well as you guys to interact with each other and, and build this community of people who want to be aware of what's happening in the ocean it doesn't matter whether you're a fisher like a recreational fisher a commercial fisher somebody who's in business or marketing uh, you could just be any. You don't. Have, you don't have to be a scientist. You just have to be one concerned with the ocean and what's going on with it, and wanting to help it. That's that's what I love about. It. So you can be from any walk of life, anywhere in the world, listening to this podcast. All of a sudden, you want to join this group because you want to take part, and that helps in getting you involved in ocean conservation. That can count as something you do to get involved in ocean conservation. You don't always have to do something physical to, to do something. You can do something by just making yourself aware or other people aware based on what questions you have and concerns and stuff like that. And if you have a topic that we want that you want to, uh, to for me to cover or for any of the the collaborators here on Speak Up for Blue to to cover on 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 the podcast, you know, let us know in in the comment in in the uh, in the group. That's the best place to do it. So uh, yeah, go over. All you have to do is go to speakupforblue.com forward slash group. And you can just uh, request, like, use your Facebook account, request to join. I usually let people in within within 24 hours. And uh, introduce yourself when you get in there. Tell us your favorite species. Tell us your favorite habitat. Or tell us your favorite movie about the oceans, whether it's a documentary or a movie itself and uh, whatnot. So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, you know, that's what we talk about in, in the Facebook group. So it's always always fun, always a good time in there. And there's some good debates going on, too, which is always fun. Um, so yeah, join speakupforblue.com forward slash group. Let's start the show. If you are sick of hearing of the doom and gloom of the ocean and not knowing what to do, you're in the right place. If you want to meet people working to protect the ocean, then you are in the right place. If you want to find out how you can get involved in protecting the ocean, then you are in the right place. This is the Speak Up For Blue podcast, and I am here to empower you to live for a better ocean. Hey everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Speak Up For Blue podcast. I am your host, Andrew Lewin, founder of speakupforblue.com, marine ecologist and self-proclaimed oceanpreneur. That's right. Speak Up For Blue is a media and communications company and we are hitting the ground running. 
we are all about saving the ocean. And that's why I termed it oceanpreneur. I'm somebody <clears throat> who is all about uh, wanting to protect the ocean. Everything we do here at Speak Up for Blue, from our programs, from our products, um, and just from our awareness of what, what content we produce. And that is sort of the key. That is our niche, if you will, to get the information out there to the public, the right information out there to the public to get people talking about it because that's the first thing we really need to do. That's like the, you know, the, the fight in the trenches for scientists and conservationists is to get people to talk about marine science and conservation because um, once you get it on your mind, then you want to know more. And I think it's, it's easy to find more once you're willing to look for it. So, uh, yeah, that's always, a, that's always what we, we like to talk about here. Uh, today, we've got a great show for you. We're going to talk about uh, two things. Uh, we're going to talk, one, we're going to talk about um, fisheries. And there's a disconnect. See, there's an article that just came out on NBC News um, that I found uh, in my flip book that I use online. Uh, it was a, uh, a story about a fisherman. It starts out with a story about a fisherman who is very concerned with the way the fisheries quotas in the UK and EU are are divvied out, and it's and the you know it's a UK fisherman who is who is complaining about the fact that he can only catch and his him and his colleagues can only catch a certain amount of fish, while all these foreign vessels from the EU can catch a lot more, uh, and he's hoping and he's uh, he's looking forward to Brexit so that he can actually uh, get rid of you know or catch more fish, but then there's a disconnect between the fishermen. And the fishing community with everything else. So the processors and exporters that sell the fish are very concerned with what's happening, what's going to happen to the market after Brexit because of the tariffs and the taxes and everything like that that we'll have, that the UK will have on exporting fish to the EU. Because right now it's a free market. So nobody has taxes when you're part of the EU, but when you're not part of the EU, there's taxes because you're competing against other EU uh, fishing uh, countries. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And, and Griffin Carpenter, who's been on the show before, was quoted in this article. And we're going to talk about uh, some of his quotes and, and, and what that actually means. Uh, so it's a great episode there. We're also going to talk a little bit more about the animal abuse welfare that's kind of come out of Florida since this Michael Wenzel ha uh, stuff has come out. Um, if you listen to last week's episode on Monday, I talked in length about the the guy, the Michael Wenzel and his friends, who are these these young men from Florida who are dra who were basically filmed themselves dragging a shark, I'm assuming dead shark, along the uh, al along the water at high speeds, destroying the shark. Uh, they tried to get um, they tr they tried to get some sort of fame by sending it to Mark the shark, who's a notorious shark fisherman and he said uh he said i this is disgusting it's disrespectful the whole world clapped back saying it's disgusting including a governor from florida who uh governor scott who is not environmentally friendly at all from based on his policies and his actions in terms of climate change and supporting big sugar and whatnot and uh he said that it was disrespectful and horrible and there should be some law against this type of of abuse and we've had some some comments back from people in the group, which I think would be great. What I want to talk about a little bit, um, but also I want to, you know, there's other videos that have popped up, not necessarily from the same individual, but other videos have popped up from recreational fishing in uh, Florida that are uh, that are concerning to me, and other articles and comments that I've been reading that are concerning to me. And I would love for the people who listen to this who are recreational fishers, because I know a lot of people who are recreational fishers who do things properly, follow the law. Uh, treat the fish with respect uh, or treat their catch with respect and do everything properly. And I want to know if this this stuff goes on more than we know, right? Because one video can't, comes out, other videos come out too. Uh, and it's like, you, you know, it's not the only the only case. So love to hear your feedback on that. So I'm going to introduce that and love to hear your feedback within the group. But anyway, let's get started uh, to the show. Before we do, I want to let you know that we have a Patreon campaign going. Uh, it's, and this, uh, with the sponsor of this episode is our Patreon campaign. So what we're doing for the Patreon, we've, we've switched it in recent days uh, or recent weeks to uh, what we want to do. So the Speak Up for Blue Media and Communications is a, a, a social enterprise. And part of that social enterprise is a mission to help protect the oceans. Uh, we want to maintain healthy oceans and, and, and ensure that all our oceans are healthy. Uh, we have certain programs to do that. And, and 
part of our mission is to get you involved in ocean conservation, marine science and ocean conservation, whether you're a scientist or not. And one of the best ways to do that is through citizen science. And um, there are a lot of programs out there that, that, have, that allow people to go out and become citizen scientists. In other words, a citizen scientist is somebody who is not necessarily a scientist or doesn't do it for their full-time occupation, goes out on a program to help collect data. Whether you're a diver, a snorkeler, uh, somebody who observes something in the, in the wild uh, that will help a scientific project. Uh, you become a citizen scientist. And there are a lot of programs out there for citizen scientists that they can do. However, there's not a, they haven't found a program that supports citizen scientists. So that's what we're going to create here at Speak Up for Blue. It's going to be a free program where people can come and just learn about the different scientific programs or citizen science programs, uh, interact with each other, probably through a Facebook group or something like that, uh, and uh, do all that kind of stuff, right? Basically learn about it, find out more about it, see if they're interested, talk to each other, interact with each other to say, hey, I went on this program, it was really great. Or if they're going on vacation and they want to do a citizen science project um, and they and they and and you go to a place, you want to make sure that you're going to have a good time, you want to make sure that it's going to be fulfilled, and you want to make sure the program is actually show, showing results um, and all that other stuff. We're going to get feedback from citizen scientists and feed that to the different program managers. It's going to be a really great program. I'm really excited to put this together. Um, and then what we're, so what we're asking is through the Patreon campaign, campaign is support to support that program because it's going to be free. We're just asking for that program to be supported um, to help pay for uh, you know, software to help pay for just the time that we spend on actually putting this stuff together uh, and uh, and that and so forth. So uh, that's what we're asking for. So if you go to uh, Patreon, speakupforblue.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, you can contribute monthly to this program and we'll provide updates. We're going to provide all these kind of things. I do have to make some changes on our on our homepage to show what that's, what that's going to be, um, but uh, we're going to hopefully launch it soon. I got some people I need to talk to uh, to really get this program going. But yeah, I'm looking forward to it. This is going to be a lot of fun, and uh, I think it's great. Uh, so the if you're not familiar with Patreon, it's a monthly contribution site for crowdfunding. So that means people can fund something that they're really interested in, whether it be video creator, podcast creator, or just program in general. You can help fund that if you think it's important to you. Uh, and put that together. So if you go to speakupforblue.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, you can help fund this citizen science program, which is one in many that we're going to be coming up with. So uh, keep looking forward to that. Plus, you get to have a chance to, to talk about our business, to talk about the program uh, and, and see what direction and give it suggestions on what direction you'd like to see it go or software or anything like that of the actual logistics. So that's it. So speakupforblue.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And let's start the show. So we're going to talk about this article here uh, that I, that I read this morning, uh, and I, I think it's a great it, it, it's a great way to speak about these types of these types of uh, news because um, it's on it was on NBC News, and uh, the article is Brexit Britain, the island nation's fishermen, and the battle with EU. Now we had on Griffin Carpenter, who is a policy uh, analyst. Uh, in the EU, in the, in the UK, and he works for a think tank. And for God sakes, I can't remember the name of the think tank that he works for right now. Um, however, he does a lot of policy research on uh, all things uh, EU related, but especially fishing. And um, he he was great on the show when he when he came out. I'm just trying to see what his actual title is. Uh, hold on one sec. No, I don't see it. Hopefully, I'll see it a little later, but I'll put it on. Like, I'll I'll link to the in the show notes to his article, uh, or to his um, to his uh, his his podcast, the, the episode that we had on. But he was great in terms of really breaking down the different types of of EU policies and the quotas, and talking about the interaction with, with the fishing communities in the different countries and stuff, especially with the UK and what it's going to look like to Brexit. And his main conclusion from that from that episode that he that he stated was the biggest problem was not necessarily redistributing the fishing quotas was but was the how to export from the U, the fishing the fish from the UK the products of seafood from the UK to EU which is where I think I think it's like 50 to 60 percent of the exports go to and the way it's set up now is anywhere in 
the UK, if you export to the EU, you don't pay any extra taxes or tariffs. Um, you just you can just sell them freely. But when Brexit comes and the negotiations come, there's going to be some sort of taxes on the exports from the UK into the uh, into the EU because they want to protect the rest of the EU countries, right? If you're part of the EU, you the the understanding is you get some sort of um, access, some sort of, of of benefit to sell to each other across border, across country borders, but within the EU. So now the UK is not really going to um, going to have that benefit anymore, and they're going to have to compete with other countries that are exporting into the into the EU. And and the last time when we spoke uh, to Griffin, he said that uh, Canada was has become. Uh, an exporter, like sort of a preferred exporter that has an agreement with the EU to pay lower taxes that will actually bring in more of their exports into the EU. So now the UK has other countries competing for the same type of fish that are going into to the EU. So, you know, the article, is, I found the article really, uh, really well laid out. It starts off talking about um, this fisherman who is uh, who's fishing on the east coast of Cornwall, and he says there's so many fish. But we can't catch them. We can only count. We can only catch a certain amount. Now, a lot of times on the on the east side of Cornwall, it's a small scale fishery, so they can only you know be based on their boats and the amount of catch. I guess they were only allowed to fish so many, so they had a, a smaller quota. Yet other EU countries can come in and and fish within the six to twelve nautical mile limit, and they from the country and they were from the country shoreline, and they were actually able to to get more because they have bigger ships. I assume. Um, so there's frustration within the fishing community in the UK that it seems like EU boats can actually ca- catch more than UK boats. And they're looking forward to Brexit because they can actually catch more and they don't have to compete with out-of-country fishing. Um, and that might help because nobody else will be able to catch the fish within that area and that could be export. That fish maybe provide more unique fish when they export. But all that the fishermen are worried about is catching more fish to sell to the to the distributors and the processors, and they'll, the the fishermen will make more money. However, the article goes on talking about the exporters and their concerns, the fact that they ship at least sixty, sometimes seventy percent of their of their exports to the EU. So after Brexit, what's going to happen? There are a lot, of, like, you know, there's a lot of unknowns. That are going to happen, but there's probably going to be some sort of tariffs, and that's going to be a concern. And later on in the article, they also talked to another uh, another processor who said that the EU were providing uh, grants to allow um, processors and distributors of seafood to grow their business, and they they literally went from six people, six employees, to ninety employees. But most of those ninety employees are from uh, people are people from outside the UK but within the EU. So they're, I guess they're foreign workers, you would say, but they're EU workers. And they, he said, what happens if, you know, if the EU disappears from the UK, so Brexit happens, are they going to be, is the UK government going to be picking up the same type of grant money to provide, to provide subsidies basically for these employees? And what's going to happen to these employees? Do they have to go back to the EU and they won't be allowed in the UK? And then that means that money is that the him paying that same amount of employees in the UK is actually going to go up cuz i assume the price of of a of a of an employee in the UK is more than perhaps somewhere else in the EU so there's a lot of concern with with exporters uh in that area and uh they talk to they they you know they quote um uh griffin uh as saying that there are a lot of different um you know, there's a lot of policy questions to to concern themselves with, um, and they start going on. So, I'm just trying to get the amount, the like the the quote here from Griffin. Um, hold on one sec. All right, here it is. Okay, so Griffin is an economist as well. Just he's not just he doesn't just do policy. He does policy, but from an economist point of view. Um, but he said here the European quotas had allowed fish stocks to replenish after failing to dangerously low levels. So he said the UK is in the healthier state that it has been is in the healthier state than it has been in decades, and largely due to the EU's management. EU fish stocks are now increasing. 
Um, the EU's had to make hard decisions about fishing quotas, and there is a concern that we might have that we might be leaving the EU and the common fisheries policy, which is the policy for the EU, as soon as things are as soon as things are getting better. So he admitted that there were problems surrounding the quotas, but the British government shared the blame for, with the EU for poor implementation. So while more than 75% of the British fishing fleet is made up of small-scale vessels, they only hold 1.5% of the overall quota, according to the data compiled by Carpenter. This, this helps explain, he said, why many small fishermen were struggling to get by. However, Brexit won't help these fishing businesses, said Carpenter. That's the greatest inequity in UK fisheries, and Brexit is set to further this divide, he said, explaining that he thought the large vessels would gobble up the possible quota gains after Brexit. So there are, there's a lot of concern right here. And I guess what the point that I want to make in this situation is there's a huge disconnect between the fishing industry in the UK, the processing industry in the UK, and then the policies, the guideline, and the quotas, and the health of the stocks, uh, which is, I guess, would be the scientists. The fishing, you know, the fishing community is blaming the scientists for setting these quotas, and of course the EU government and the policy. But the, you know, according to to Griffin, you know, the the, the quotas were put in to ensure that the the stocks are replenished. And now that the stocks are replenished, you got to be careful that not to go crazy and open up the quotas that they were historically, and then just deplete the stock again. You got to do it a lot more sustainably. But it seems like there is, and I, and I don't know. I'm not going to say. Based on this article, it seems like there's a huge disconnect and there's there's no communication between the government, the scientists, and the, the fishing community in the UK. There's That's a big problem there. And I don't know if, if – this is just based on this article. I don't know if that's the case, but that seems to be the problem with small-scale fisheries, communication with, with scientists, communication with um, – with uh, governments and, and whatnot. And I feel like you need a lot more, you know, the, the, of the social science where the scientists, that, the marine social scientists like Ed, that, to come in and speak to um, and, and interact with the, fishing, with the fishing community in the UK to find out what's going on, you know, and what their concerns are and how that, can, how that translates into setting policy in the future uh, with balancing with a healthy fishery stock. Um, you know, there's, and it, it seems like there's also... A lack of knowledge of how you know that what the, the the article made it seem like the fishermen don't really know how Brexit's going to affect the exporters, right? And, and not just the fishing community, but the exporters. So yeah, you might be able to fish more fish, but you who's going to buy it? And if people aren't buying it, what are you going to do, right? That's that's a I think that's a big concern when there's that disconnect in communication and understanding, and I think that's where it really needs to uh, improve. Uh, based on this article, I'm only basing this on this article. I don't know the situation. If somebody is in the UK and they understand and they and they want to know, uh, and and they know more about me on the uh, on this subject, please let me know. Because we we you know we've talked about it with with uh, Griffin Carpenter before on the podcast, um, but we never really dived into the details. We would, we only had time to do the overview of what's happening with the EU policy and how that's going to affect how Brexit's going to affect it. Um, and then we talked about exporters and, and, and fishing communities and, and whatnot, but we never really got into the, the bare bones of the fishing community and, and what their thoughts are and how it's going to affect the whole food, a whole sort of supply chain from catching all the way to exporting and all the way to consuming. So that's sort of what I want to highlight about this article was the fact that it's just it's, it seems really disconnected and that we really need to improve those connections and the, that lines of communication um, and I don't know if that's been done in the past, but it seems to help solve a lot of problems in the future. So that's sort of what my take is on that. The next story I want to talk about uh, is this animal abuse stuff. Oh, God. I'm not sure if you've seen it. So I'm, if you haven't followed it, uh, I'll, I'll, you can go to last week's episode to take a look for the details. But um, there is a, a number of videos that have, that have come to light uh, for the, over the past couple of weeks. But one in particular was a shark being dragged at high speed over the ocean. And it was on an Instagram account by this guy, Michael Wenzel. Uh, now, he's since asked the police to, and his family have since asked the police to put extra patrols around the house because he received a lot of threats over social media. I'm assuming a lot of those were death threats. Um, now, I don't advocate violence on anybody or any animal. However, uh, I understand where it's coming from. There's a lot of people on social media who definitely go crazy in terms of like threatening people and whatnot. And I, I, don't, I don't agree with it. I don't condone it. 
uh, but I, you know, I'm not surprised. You know, a lot, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of people who love animals out there, and they don't want to see them treated this way. Uh, we don't know if the shark was dead. We don't know what type of shark it was. We don't know. Uh, at the time when I did it, we didn't know if anything was going to happen. Um, but since then, there have been several videos that I found online uh, through Facebook news feeds, through my Instagram, um, just people sharing stuff with me, where you've seen recreational fishermen do weird things. You know, and I don't know if it's a, just a lack of knowledge in handling large fish or sharks or swordfish or anything like that i saw one guy catch a hammerhead shark it was still in the water on the line and i don't I, I, and of course this is it this seems to be in florida i don't know if it's within florida waters because that would be illegal uh depending on the on the type of hammerhead uh but he shot it in the water took out his gun and shot it i mean from a canadian looking down into america you can't get more american than that i guess uh, in a in a sarcastic sort of joking tone, uh, but it's sad to see this is how we treat animals, um, and it it really made me think to think. Look, if this is if this is you know one or two videos have come out in the past week, that means this stuff happens quite often. And I read a couple of comments and and uh, on 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 different articles where people are saying this this type of behavior is not is not new. It's not unique. You know, the the shark dragging things, apparently people do that quite a bit. And I don't know if it's if it's a, a function of we're going to drag the shark behind us because our boat's not big enough. Uh, and we're going to do it at a slower rate. But I would imagine for, from someone, I don't know, I would imagine that there would just be almost like a bait for maybe a larger shark to come and grab or fish to grab. You know, I, I, I can't see it. Maybe that's why they go at high speeds. I don't know. I, I really don't know the reasoning behind it. Is there reasoning behind it other than just the joy of watching a shark bounce around uh, on on the water at high speeds? I really don't know. But it seemed like from a commenter saying that, yeah, yeah, this happens all the time. We just don't go that as fast. You know, so it really makes me concerned at individual actions on the water, whether it be in Florida or anywhere else around the world that this is happening more than we actually think. And I am oblivious to this type of stuff uh, because I'm not a, a, a recreational fisher. And not necessarily because I don't like fishing. I respect a lot of recreational fishers. I have a lot of friends. I, I, I mean, I, I help, I, I help pr produce content uh, for the Fish Nerds podcast, which are made up of a lot of recreational fishers, which have been great. They have a great group in there, and they... They're very concerned about conservation, and they have a lot of great questions, and, and, and I've helped answer some of those, and we've had a lot of great discussions on sort of differences and thought processes and, and policies and, and whatnot, and they're a great group. And if you haven't listened to Fish Nerds, I, I highly recommend you go to iTunes and, and listen to, to Fish Nerds, uh, the Fish Nerds podcast. Clay, Clay who hosts it, is, is fantastic, and he's very into conservation and sustainable seafood. He's been on the podcast before, uh, and we just love him. So... It's just, I just, you know, I, I want to know if this is like something that happens all the time. And it doesn't have to be with marine fish. It could be with freshwater fish. But it's like, what are people thinking? And I feel that, you know, when you have, when you're fishing, and I know like, the, you know, one, one person in our group sort of uh, said, when I said, oh, there should be laws against this, like a, an overall abuse law. And he said, well, look, you know, he was a, he was a libertarian, so he, he doesn't like all these laws governing them that's fine um but he you know he kind of went on he said well, if you put a law against abusive animals how are people going to interpret it you know are you going to get the sort of the extremists that we saw in a video where um there was a video of i guess they were a vegan group that went around and they were they were they basically harassed these two fishermen who were fishing over a bridge legally they caught a fish and the, the guy actually the, the protester actually threw it back um, it made it made it went viral for a bit, and a lot of people were were pretty annoyed by these by these protesters. Um, and I don't I don't appreciate the way they they did their their thing. Um, some protesters just don't know how to protest. But you know, um, I lost my train of thought. Sorry, but you know, it's it. I guess no. Sorry. So what he was worried about the the person in the group was worried about was the fact that you know if we put a law against overall. Um, 
uh, animal abuse. It's like, well, how do we, how do people interpret that animal abuse? You get protesters like that who say fishing is animal abuse. And I can understand that. And do I think uh, fishing is animal abuse? No, I don't. Um, depending on the fisher, on the fisher, and depending on how the fisher treats the animals, I feel that there's a protocol, almost like an un, you know, like a like a unsaid protocol that and unsaid respect that fishermen or that fishers have for their catch, right? When they if they catch a fish, they do kill the fish. They do it as quickly as possible if they're going to keep it, but if they're going to release it, they're going to release it. They're going to obey the laws, whether they agree with them or not. They're going to obey the laws. But they're also going to respect nature because fishers are in nature for a reason. Not just to catch fish, but they enjoy the ocean. They enjoy being on the lake. They enjoy being surrounded by a forest. They enjoy being out on the water, right? Just like any of us would, but they want to catch fish while doing it. And I think there's just sort of this, this unsaid you know, protocol that fish like fishers will follow and it's all based on respect nature enjoy sort of the fruits of your labor but it respect nature and what it's given you and i and i and i have a, a deep respect for that so i don't consider fishing done in the proper way as animal abuse but to the extent of what we've seen where you're where people are like you know using using uh, like pouring beer over top a hammerhead shark that's still alive to drink from it one is disgusting but just the, the act of it and the thought that they could do that and that would be okay is disgusting and i feel that more and more of these videos are coming out where people are doing this stuff and i just i, I, I i'm concerned i'm concerned for one, how it, how it shows, how it reflects on the recreational fishing community, the people who do it properly and follow the law and are sustainable. That doesn't look good on them, even though they do great work. When you look at when and these videos make headlines in the mainstream media and in social media, and people are like, oh, all recreational fishers are, are like this. And I, I don't believe it. I really don't because of the people that I've interacted with and know. And uh, in fact, there are a lot of scientists who are, who are big into fishing. You know, and they do it properly, and they help other people. They get involved in their in their uh, fishing clubs, and they they help make sure things are sustainable, and make sure we don't catch endangered species and all that kind of stuff. So, I don't know, guys. Like, what's like for the people who are recreational fishers? I'd love for you to help me out, and I would love for you to let me know if this happens more often. If this type of stuff happens more often than not, and if you see this stuff happening, do you do anything about it? Or is it just more of a shock and I can't believe that's done. I'm never going to fish with that person again. I, I just don't know. You know, I, I don't know how you guys act towards that kind of stuff. If you see your friend or a colleague or anything like that go out or the first time you're fishing with somebody and they treat animals like that, do you speak up? Do you, um, do you report it? How does that, how does that all work? I'd love to know. I really would. And I'd love to know if this happens more than we think. So go to speakupforblue.com forward slash groups or forward slash group. Join the, pod, join the group if you're not already there. If you're in the group, I'd love uh, for you guys to let me know. Uh, that's the episode for today. Um, sorry to kind of end on a somber note, but I thought this was a great episode. I think this is the stuff that we need to talk about. You know, commercial fishing in the face of Brexit on the UK. I know a lot of you are, are U.S. listeners and North American listeners, but the U.K. is very important, especially with what happened, what's happening with Brexit and everything and, and the policies and exporting. It's really going to change the game um, for a lot of people and livelihoods, I guess. Uh, but uh, And then this, this abuse stuff, uh, I just think we need to talk about it. We need to know more about it than, than, than we actually do. So, uh, yeah, anyway, that's the episode for today. I really appreciate you guys uh, listening. By the way, if you want to help... Uh, help me set up this uh, citizen science program you can help by contributing to our patreon campaign speak up for blue.com forward slash patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n uh, and of course go to the group speak up for blue.com forward slash group to continue this conversation in the facebook group but other than that thank you very much for listening i am your host andrew lewin happy monday have a great week we have a great episode coming up on wednesday with dr dave ebert uh, who's done a lot of stuff in looking for lost sharks and discovering species we're going to talk about the endangered species act and all sorts of iucn red list species um, it's gonna be a lot of fun so stay tuned happy happy monday have a great week see you on wednesday i'm angel lewin 
Happy conservation.